<laughs> so as always, uh, we begin all things by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So if you can please do us the honor by introducing yourself to uh, to our listeners and viewers and tell us about your remarkable work. I am uh, Brendan Reimer. I work at Assiniboine Credit Union. I have a very unique role and title and that is strategic partner of values-based banking. And basically what that means is I work uh, through all departments in, in the company, so in the credit union and at all leadership levels to embed our values and our purpose into everything that we do uh, so that we're living our values, we're putting our values into action every day in every way. Um, I'm based here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, for those who are not uh, from these parts. And as a Manitoba-based credit union, uh, what that means is we are a financial institution, uh, but we are owned by the 140,000 Manitobans who use our services every day. So we're a collectively, cooperatively owned credit union. It means that the members choose the board of directors. They uh, they have democratic control in that way. And it means that our purpose uh, is focused on the well-being of the members who have chosen to join our credit union, who collectively own the credit union. And so our entire sense of purpose is their well-being. Amazing. I love that. And I love that model. You know, anytime... Um... I'm in meetings with people who are part of like a co-op credit union, those things. It's, 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 it's a very fulfilling model and we need, definitely need more, more of that for sure. And uh, could you articulate your personal mission and vision for us? Well, it, it's uh it's maybe tough to do a, a personal mission, but it's, uh, it, I wouldn't work at a place like a cinema and credit union, if the values and the vision and the mission weren't very closely aligned with my own personal sense of purpose in life. And uh, I mean, really for me, I've worked in a variety of fields over the years, whether it's in restorative justice or community economic development, now in a credit union, but it has always been about trying to change systems and societal structures to make our world more sustainable, more equitable, more inclusive, and more resilient. And the, the vision of a cinema and credit union is a world where innovative financial services contribute to a sustainable future for all. And I really hang on to those last five words. It, it's it's uh, a sustainable future for all. Really makes you think through all the structures you have in society. Um, you don't have a sustainable future if you don't have climate resilience and, and if we don't stop the extinction of species and if we don't um, tackle climate change, we don't have a sustainable society if we don't have economic justice, if we don't have um, equitable economics yeah, where, where people are able to live a decent quality of life, where we have eliminated poverty. We don't have a sustainable future in our society if we uh, if we have racism, hate, discrimination in any form, where people are left out because of who they are, uh, and in, I mean, in our country we don't have a sustainable future if we have not meaningfully engaged in the healing journey of reconciliation. So there's so many aspects of it. So it's so much more than finance. People think you know a credit union that's about banking, and it's true that is our vehicle, but it is our vehicle for building a sustainable future for all. It is our tool, if you will. So we use finance as a force for good because it's what we do. It happens to be our industry, but our purpose is something so much bigger than it. Absolutely. And again, with credit unions, that's that's a big plus. And with the large number of uh, members that are part of it, you know why, right? Because it's, it's uh, proof is in the pudding. <laughs> And what inspires you most about your current work? I think it's that sense of, um, there's a compelling purpose 
to this kind of work because Personally, uh, my view is that uh, this is some of the most important work in society. These factors, what I just talked about, are the difference between people having the kind of life that we all aspire to. Yeah, excuse me. The, the difference between people having a good quality of life or struggling in life. It's a difference between being included and feeling a sense of belonging and a sense of potential or feeling like or knowing or understanding how the system is stacked against you. And so if this becomes the most compelling work that we as society are facing, it is exciting for me every single day to come to work and know that the company I'm a part of has that same sense of purpose, the same sense of urgency, the same sense of what's important and the same kind of vision of the world that we want to live in together. Perfectly said. And um, what challenges or barriers do you face in your work and how do you and your team work to overcome them? That's a great question. Um, with, with this kind of work, there's the day-to-day -day challenges of any organization of any business but if we're talking more around the sense of purpose and vision and mission the biggest challenge is you can't do everything and you can't do it all at once so there really has to be you know, i've talked about this before in other settings a commitment to relentless incrementalism in some ways uh, yes, we all want the radical transformation and we want it to happen tomorrow. But whether it's society or whether it's organizations, that's just usually not how change happens. And so we have to be comfortable with the enormity of the changes that we're trying to address and also comfortable knowing that we can only do our part and we can only do as much as we can at any given time. Without being overwhelmed by it and without being discouraged by it, but live in that space relentlessly committed to doing our part every day toward the changes that we're looking for. It was uh, years ago, there was uh, a colleague of mine who used to speak to, uh, to college graduation classes often and would challenge students to find a sense of purpose. And um, would say, you know, it doesn't matter what, what profession you go into, what industry you go into, finding a true sense of purpose will be the biggest thing that determines your level of satisfaction with life and career. And he said, the places where you find purpose are in work that you cannot accomplish by yourself and in work that cannot be accomplished in your own lifetime. And in that space is where you really find purpose. So if we're talking about environmental sustainability, if we're talking about human rights and um, social justice, if we're talking about economic sustainability and economic resilience and the elimination of poverty, we can't accomplish those by ourselves. And we may not even accomplish those within our own lifetime. But it's in that work that we find enormous purpose when we commit ourselves to it. And, and we, uh, we build the path by walking and we, uh, we create that journey. I love that. It's like that saying, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, you know, go with a group. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. I hope I got that part right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I use that one often as well. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's mm -hmm. it. Amazing. Amazing. And do you have any key priorities in your work right now? Um, yeah, all of the important things all at one time, right? Um, I think there's a few things, um, that we're always looking to evolve. One of them is the role of finance and it's because it's our industry. Um, we can get involved in political advocacy work. We can get involved in supporting human rights. We can be involved 
in reducing our own carbon footprint. We can do a lot of things with our own behavior and our own actions. But part of the question is, as a financial institution, how do you use finance to drive that change? How do you use finance to, um, to engage in reconciliation? How do you use finance to support transition to a green economy? Um, and how do you use finance? Even how do you question uh, how finance is currently structured when you're assessing disparities between different groups of people in our province or in our country? So those are big questions and those are challenging questions. But for me, as a leader at a financial institution, at a credit union, that becomes a very important question because if someone else is in the food industry or works with a social service agency, right? Like everybody's role will look a bit different in terms of how they address these big challenges. Um, our role is finance and we need to figure it out because we need to be part of the solution. That's so true. That's so true. And, you know, leading up to my next question is like, I can ask, how do you feel about the future of co-op? How do you feel about the future? You know, but I think this, the one that I'm would be more resonated for this interview is how do you feel about the future of social finance? in Canada. So how do you feel about oh, yeah. the future of social finance? Can you Canada? repeat that? You're freezing a little bit. Oh, am I freezing? Sorry about that. Let's see. Can you see me now? Am I okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So how, how do you, I was saying like, I can say, you know, how do you feel about the future of co, uh, uh, the future of co-op in Canada? But I think the right question is, how do you feel about the future of social finance? Uh, you up again. Oh, oh my goodness. Were you asking about the future of co-ops? Uh, social finance. I think that's the one I'll ask. How do you feel about the future of social finance? I think it's really exciting that so many people are exploring it. And even just a few decades ago, there might've been a handful of organizations in Canada that we're doing social finance, that we're familiar even with the language and the concepts. And now it's part of federal government programs. There's leaders in every province in Canada. There are community-based organizations, social enterprises, cooperatives, and others who are leveraging tools and exploring and becoming more com uh, comfortable with social finance as a mechanism to advance their mission. So I think it's really exciting. Um, because of course there's so much, there is so much money in our world, in our country. We have enough wealth on this planet so that no single human being should ever not have shelter or food or education or basic needs met. It's all about distribution. And we've set structures in place as human beings that have meant that not everybody has access to all of these things. The opportunity within that is that we can make different choices. But beyond that, even in the world of finance, I mean, the world of finance is enormous. And for the most part, over the years, finance has been used to make money. And so it has a very, it has had a very narrow purpose. And I think to harness the power and potential of finance to create social good is a very exciting opportunity. And it is, there's a lot of things that can be done to make the world a better place that don't require finance, but often they do. And often to bring something to scale, you do need financing. And so to bring together the scale and the, the, the scale of need that we have around the world and in our communities and start to bring that together with the scale of finance that is at work in our economies um, has huge potential. The one caveat I would put to that is that financing is not the answer to all aspects of this work. Not all organizations um, can accomplish their missions through different and creative financing mechanisms. We need public investment through grants uh, to support so many of the initiatives that, um, that we have going on. Whether it's a women's resource center in a low-income neighborhood, um, 
right? There, there's so many initiatives that are so important in our communities that just require public investment with long-term core funding. So there are times where I uh, am cautious, even concerned, that the conversation on social finance takes on almost a life of its own. And it's, it's sometimes perceived that this will solve all our social problems. When I, I you know, I, it concerns me that, that, that it, it's taking a traditional tool and trying to apply it to every circumstance uh, where we're dealing with community issues. So if we're going to talk about robust, uh, stable, long-term core funding for a lot of the nonprofit organizations doing the most important work in our communities, and we're going to talk about social finance as a way to scale, then I think we have a really interesting conversation. But if we're going to talk about social finance as a model to replace or to justify the reduction or cutting of core funding to community-based organizations, I think we're just going to end up uh, with more problems than we have now. So true. You have you drop so much gems in that. <laughs> it's like where I go, you know, like you said, we're 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 very rich. Nobody should be homeless. No, you know, there shouldn't be, you know, a uh, food desert, you know, as what has been progressing here, especially in Canada, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's right on the nose with so many of those issues. I thank you for that. Um and what is your ultimate goal and what does success look like to you and your colleagues? Well, I was uh, I was involved back a number of years ago when the vision statement was uh, was crafted and that phrase, a sustainable future for all, that, that is success. Now, that means many different things and that will, you know, <clears throat> our journey will take many, many years, maybe generations to get there. So yes, we do measure success in the meanwhile. Uh, we have you know, smaller measures as a credit union. Again, we work with finance. So we measure, for example, how much money we have invested in affordable housing. And this became an important focus a number of years ago. I think at that point we had 30 million invested in affordable housing and now it's 150 million uh, because we built relationships, we focused in that area and we know that we've been able to finance the improvement and the building of new affordable housing units in our communities. So we measure number of units, we measure uh, the amount of funds allocated to affordable housing initiatives, right? We measure greenhouse gas emission reductions and uh, we set targets on that. So that's success. We've got, got to carbon neutral a few years ago, but now we're starting to look at the carbon footprint of our, financed, of our financing. So it's one thing to be carbon neutral in our own operations, but we finance a lot of vehicles and a lot of homes and a lot of companies, small businesses that all create a carbon footprint as well, right? So we we measure that, we track it. And we're always asking the question, how can we do better? And how can we support our membership and our communities in getting closer to a sustainable future for all? So yeah, we measure progress in a lot of these ways. Um, one of the things that's really important to us is B Corp certification. And uh, we went through that three years ago and this past summer we got recertified and it's a very thorough and rigorous assessment of uh, the, the degree to which the company has em embedded social and environmental values into its core operations. From a governance perspective, uh, the workplace you're creating, um, you know, it looks into areas of customers and it's not just are your customers happy with your company, it's are you creating access for customers who may not otherwise be able to access your goods or services. And we have partnerships, for example, with 40, over 40 nonprofits in our communities who identify people who are unbanked and often they don't have ID. And what that means is that when they need to do banking, they're often going to fringe financial outlets, check cashers, payday lenders, pawn shops, and paying exorbitant fees for very basic transactions. And so we've been able to work with community-based organizations to get people their ID and to bring them in as members of our credit union. And we bring in over a thousand Manitobans in as member owners of our credit union through those programs every year. So again, we measure that. Um, we know there's more because every year there's another thousand to join us through those partnerships. But um, 
yeah, it's it's uh, it's important, I guess, and that goes back to what I was saying before, recognizing that the need is huge and you can only do your part. So your part won't solve all the issues, but it certainly makes a difference to those thousand people who are now members of a credit union as opposed to cashing their check at, uh, at a really expensive place. Yeah, that's huge. That's I said in uh, another interview I was doing, and uh, you know, she felt that she didn't think she would be a big contributor to this. I said, "Oh my goodness!" When we were done the interview, I said, "Listen, it's that little pebble, it's the yeah. little pebble that drops into the water that makes the biggest ripple." So never underestimate that small little puzzle piece that adds to the completion of the puzzle. You know, so that's 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 so important. To, to get that point across, because you are changing lives, even if it's the smallest, you're still changing lives, and that's amazing. Well, and another okay, area Brendan. is, I was gonna mm -hmm. add one other piece, and that's, that's always looking through your company's operations. And I would say, where companies often start when they wanna contribute to communities, they might make some donations or they might do some volunteering, which are very important things to do. One of the areas that we've really been exploring lately, and I think I certainly, always encourage other companies to do this as well as look at where they're doing their purchasing. So whereas our credit union will give out $500,000 a year in grants, which are really important, you know, $4,000 might buy a new washer dryer for women's resource center and it might run every second of the day that they're open because it's the only place women can do laundry in their neighborhood. That's important. And $500,000 of that will go a very long way and make a huge difference in people's lives. But we started focusing on our purchasing as a credit union. And we started to track and, and, and look for opportunities to purchase from nonprofits. And this might even be meeting space. You know, if we have meeting space, are we going to a hotel chain or are we going to a local nonprofit that has a meeting room and paying them instead? Um, and spending at other cooperatives. We bought, uh, you know, $15,000 worth of food in the past couple of years to send to community-based organizations who are providing food for people in their community. We bought that at the at the co-op. So we look to buy at nonprofits, at co-ops, at other B Corps, um, locally owned businesses, indigenous owned businesses, and purchases that are specifically fair trade or support environmental sustainability. And at our credit union, that purchasing comes to around $24 million a year. So $500,000 in grants is really important, but we can also have a powerful impact um, on values aligned businesses and supporting the mission and the outcomes that they're creating by being deliberate and thoughtful with our purchases. We're still getting the product or service that we need. The price is competitive, but by being thoughtful and by including social and environmental metrics in our purchasing decisions, we've been able to have a huge economic impact with organizations that are also contributing to social environmental outcomes. Perfect addition. That's a perfect addition. And that's definitely to be noticed as well. So that when people go back to this video and watch it, they'd be like, you know what? That's amazing. We got to do that. You know, following your footsteps. That's great. Every company and last every question, person, every government spends money. And it's uh, we sometimes yeah. say every dollar we spend is a vote for the kind of world we want to live in. So being thoughtful perfect. how and where we spend our money is a way we can also shape our world. Absolutely. I 100% agree. <laughs> and do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action at this time? Well, it depends who's listening, I guess. But if it's people who work in a business, who lead a business, who own a business, I guess my call to action would be uh, join uh, join the movement of people using business as a force for good. Um, explore B Corp certification, find, your, uh, find the B Corps and the purpose-driven businesses in your community. For years, I think we've expected that governments would take on the challenges that I've been talking about. I think we've understood that individual citizens have a big responsibility, um, you know, especially when it comes to how we treat each other as human beings. And those are all true. And nonprofits have done a lot of the hardest work in society. Uh, you think of homeless shelters and different things like this. But it's time that the business community, in our communities around the world, step up and join this work we will never get a sustainable future for all unless the private sector is also part of that journey and also fully committed to doing their part using business as a force for good so that would be 
my call to action. If we all want a place for the generations that come after us to have a great place to live, um, we all need to be part of that solution. Absolutely, doing business as a, a form of uh, form of good, right? Using that uh, business and and doing good within that business, you know. That's, I think, you know. I know you can rest your head smiling at night, knowing that even if it's one life you've changed, you know, you're doing your part. So, yeah. um, just behalf of Setsu, we really appreciate that, and we thank you so much for being a part of this uh, session here today. And um, I look forward to getting this uploaded so that people can be inspired and also take some notes and follow. That's it. One, one chain next, you know, it's, it's like that chain link, you know? You have one, grab on to the other, and that's how we make change. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was wonderful to chat with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I enjoyed this. Thank you. You're so welcome. So as we begun our interview, we're going to end it the same way. So we begin all, uh, end all things too by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. Uh, we acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So once again, Brendan, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. I love those uh, openings and closing, by the way. Those, they're wonderful. Oh, awesome. We Thank you. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. You too, dear. Bye-bye.